Malcolm Forbes was the irrepressible dreamer, passionate about everything he pursued. He cultivated each endeavor with infinite zeal, an avid collector, world-class balloonist, publishing magnet, raconteur, and visionary. His greatest pleasure came from being alive and sharing his enviable position with the world. Whether it was bringing smiles to the faces of millions from his fantastic balloons, or proudly showing off his Fabergé eggs, it seemed that he took greater pleasure in sharing his wealth than in having it himself. He may have been the ultimate capitalist, but he was also the great adventurer. Traveling the world by balloon and motorcycle, he had the ability to draw people in as participants, not just spectators. He took up ballooning and broke world records. He took up collecting and amassed one of the world's greatest fortunes. He would tell you that his greatest achievement was his family. Four sons and a daughter carry on his legacy. In everything he did, from business to ballooning, Malcolm Forbes was truly the grand sportsman. Success is doing what turns you on, doing what you enjoy doing. Normandy, France. A carnival-like atmosphere prevails over the grounds of a 300-year-old estate. Children flock to this scene as dozens of workers mobilize to build the trappings of a gala international event with the flavor of a traveling roadshow, complete with food, sideshows, rides, and of course, fireworks. Surrounded by 200-year-old beech trees, the grounds begin to collect an odd montage of colorful shapes. And the man responsible for all this begins his day with a pleasant ride on his Harley. Malcolm Forbes was once described as the quintessential man who could not bear to keep to himself the good joke he had just heard. And if his principal contribution was consolidating that particular blend of exuberance and hard work that justified being, as he loved to say, a capitalist tool, then he showed us how to live life as the ultimate capitalist with a childlike joy. For his was a world in which everyone shared his pleasure. Especially the 17th century estate Chateau de Balois. Chateau de Balois was uh, built in 1625. It was designed by Francois Mossard. It is the earliest extant, I think, example of his work. Uh, and it is simply a magnificent structure. It is as uh, beautiful a piece of uh, freestanding architecture as I'm aware of. What's extraordinary, and I've done this several times and always with awe, is when you walk 365 degrees around it, it finds a perfect symmetry. No matter what point on the compass you look at the building, it finds a perfect symmetry. It's extraordinary. Just 22 miles from the D-Day landing beaches of World War II, the Chateau was a major American headquarters, saved from destruction only because the Germans had used it as a hospital. Ironically, after landing at Omaha Beach, Malcolm passed within several hundred yards of the estate. Wounded near Aachen, he spent nine months in the hospital nursing a shattered thigh bone. Uh, well, uh, the weather looks okay at the moment, and the quicker we get these shapes up, the better we'll be. I'll feel better when they're all inflated. Each year, for the last 15 years, the Chateau has served as a backdrop for the International Balloon Meet, where Malcolm unveils his newest model. 
blooms, it's like seeing ornaments float off a Christmas tree. Uh, there's, uh, uh, they're joyful things. Nobody gets angry at a balloon, really. Uh, it's kind of a fantasy. It has no value, no functional thing. It's not an airplane swiftly getting you from one place to another. It's just pure, unadulterated fun. Not everyone is capable of producing an event of this size. Some of the balloons Forbes commissioned cost over $80,000 apiece. The International Balloon Meet at the Chateau de Balois that uh, has become an annual event, I think we've had about 15 or 16 of those now, uh, are an event that uh, Dad evolved, again, from his interest in ballooning. And each year we invite a great number of balloonists of international fame from different countries to come and represent their countries and fly a balloon. Uh, it's a weekend-long occasion celebrated with fireworks and festive dinners and a presentation of ballooning awards and whatnot that uh, all adds up to a, a, a very pleasant, exciting weekend. It's a great chance for us to bring over business guests, give them a good time, again, show them how Forbes does things with a certain sense of quality and, and flair and, and fun. Tonight we have a, a great pleasure and a great honor in having Madame Mitterrand with us. And Madame Mitterrand... <laughs> she's, she's been a wonderful sport. We took off in the Fabergé egg. We had a delightful flight. And when we landed on this little farm a few kilometers from here, we dragged a little bit, uh, Madame Mitterrand kept the dignity of France completely while the basket was dragging along the feet, along the field. She was a wonderful sport. Uh, she uh, climbed out intact and uh, said that she was most happy to have enjoyed the flight. Uh, The farmer and his wife, it was a, a lovely little farm, and uh, when we got out, uh, the farmer and his wife, uh, they recognized me as their neighbor, and they came up and were being very polite to me, and then they did a double take, Madame Mitterrand. <laughs> I tell you, the second coming could not have made such an impression as Madame Mitterrand landing on this farm totally unexpected. Okay. Tout dans la maison. Oui, on lui ressemble derrière, de toute façon. Bon, ben bon, bon. Il m'a fait monter les couleurs. Il avait l'air de planquer, là. Ah oui, alors dis donc. The wind has brought Malcolm another moment to remember. OK. Let's go back and do it again. What were the things that my father felt most important in life, I think, was not a specific thing. He realized that if you put up a building, time's going to erase it that if you put out a good magazine, uh, it goes the way of old newspapers. Uh, so yes, he would like to do the ballooning. He would like to give things. He was very generous. But I think that the most important thing was the example he set on how to live, not in a hedonistic sense, but don't look at things as obstacles. Obstacles are to be overcome. And don't be afraid of what others might say about you. He did a lot of things that could have labeled him in establishment eyes as something foolish or uncharacteristic or some other less flattering words. But uh, you got to march to your own drummer. And I think the advice you would leave is find that drummer and learn to march to it.
just is fun when other people are sharing things with you, including your money. From being a, literally being a young soldier in World War II on through to the balloons, the collecting, being a father, he had a keen sense of the worth and value of an individual life. My father was a very tough taskmaster. He responded to other people's passion. He liked people who were, he liked seeing people wanting to do something. My father left us with the work of 10 men to do. Uh, our work is cut out for us. Malcolm Forbes was the third son born to Bertie Charles Forbes and Adelaide Stevenson on August 19, 1919. B.C. Forbes had started Forbes magazine in 1917 and had got off to a sensational start in the Roaring Twenties. William Randolph Hearst took quite an interest in this new venture. And in 1928, Hearst offered my grandfather over a million dollars cash for the magazine, which was a huge sum of money in those days. My grandfather turned it down, and four years later with the Depression, the magazine was all but bankrupt in name. B.C. rode out the rough times during the Depression, and the magazine again flourished. One of the things that my grandfather always stressed is that you'll get a better feel for the prospects of a company knowing the head knocker than from the balance sheet. And that is something that stays with us today. In 1951, B.C. and Malcolm posed with some of America's leading businessmen. To Malcolm's left is Benjamin Fairless, president of U.S. Steel, and Harvey S. Firestone, Jr., chairman of Firestone Tire. Three years after this picture was taken, B.C. was dead. Malcolm became editor and publisher of the magazine, and Bruce became president of Forbes Incorporated. He loved people, which is why, I mean, many people observed he had a great common touch. It wasn't a touch, it wasn't an affected thing. He liked people, and he liked people for what they are and what they were, whatever the station was. He was interested in them for what they were doing and why they were doing it. It, it, it wasn't an affected thing, it was a, absolutely part of his uh, makeup and soul. When their father passed away, Malcolm acquired a third of the magazine, Bruce a third, and their two younger brothers the remaining third. Moreover, in the 1950s, my father spent a lot of time on his political career. He wanted to become president of the United States. That was his ambition from boyhood. He hewed to it through, uh, through the 1957 gubernatorial campaign when he was running for governor of New Jersey uh, and lost, as he put it, nose down in a landslide. That was the end of his political ambition. But uh, through the age of 38, it was something that he wanted to do with all of his heart and energy. In 1964, Bruce passed away, and Malcolm took over the helm of the magazine. He continued the fact and comment column begun by his father in the very first issue of Forbes. It was his acerbic wit and biting comment, along with his pension for hard work that triggered the magazine's explosive growth, as it eventually overtook all competitors to become America's most successful business magazine. He made it come alive. He wanted to personalize it. The magazine sort of became the business critic, sort of the, the drama critic, you might say, of American business. And my father also recognized that you've got to sell what you have. He was a tireless promoter of Forbes magazine. Everything he did was to give a certain picture in the minds of people of the magazine in a way that it had never been done before. In the late 60s, Malcolm took interest in a couple of hobbies that he would pursue for the rest of his life. As my father put it, his uh, interest in motorcycles started uh, late in life. He felt he had a deprived childhood, didn't have motorcycles. I think he picked that up when he was uh, 48 and uh, started riding, took, had a small motorcycle at first, then got a bigger one and soon became enamored of it and uh, towards in the last 10, 15 years, that's how he relaxed best, was to get on a motorcycle. At any one time, Malcolm would have over 40 motorcycles in his garage at his New Jersey estate. Whatever the season was, and I mean whatever the season was, whatever the weather was, he was out riding his motorcycle. That's the way he relaxed. That to him was terrific enjoyment. At age 52, Malcolm would discover his second passion.
he'd seen an advertisement in the news, I think the New York Times, saying, you get a ride for $50, two rides for $75. Okay. So I thought, hey, this, this sounds like it's something interesting. One reason he liked ballooning was that when people saw a balloon, they smiled. I think that what he would like, uh, he would never say it, but I think when he'd like it, when people thought about him, they would smile and say, yes, that, that's the way to do it. When Malcolm took over the magazine in the mid-60s, he hired a Detroit ad agency, which coined a catchphrase that would last for decades. The, the expression capitalist tool, the uh, tagline for the magazine, uh, originated in the 1960s. Uh, he did not originate it. An agency uh, uh, out in uh, Detroit did, uh, Campbell Ewald, but he alighted on it with great glee because uh, this was uh, at the time, you know, when Khrushchev was uh, saying he would bury you and when capitalist and capitalism were epithets to be hurled at people. And so he took it on himself and on the magazine as, as, a, as a great twist. Malcolm's great sense for history, combined with a certain nostalgia, triggered a new obsession that elicited one of the greatest collections ever seen. What prompted him to start collecting the, the, the Fabergé eggs was that as a young boy he had uh, read a history of the fall of the Romanov dynasty. And uh, uh, one of the illustrations was of uh, one of the imperial Easter eggs. And of course they were using it as an illustration of the great decay and decadence of, uh, of, of the Romanov dynasty and why and how it had fallen. And uh, somehow that image just always stuck in his mind. The eggs became the greatest collection by a private investor. Out of the 54 imperial eggs in existence, Forbes owns 12 of them. For his 11th egg, Malcolm paid nearly $2 million. The collections of toy soldiers and toy boats, uh, those evoked personal history. Those evoked the memories of being, uh, being a boy uh, with his brothers uh, playing by a brook uh, uh, down out uh, behind their house uh, uh, in Englewood, New Jersey. Most boys play with toy soldiers with their little, and uh, obviously uh, he felt he never had enough toy soldiers, so he made up for it as he got older. There are 12,000 pieces on display in New York, and over 100,000 at the Forbes Museum in Tangiers, Morocco. My father recognized that you only had a certain amount of time on this earth, and you should try and pack in as much as you can. And if you had a dream to do something, you should find a way to try to do it. And what he meant by that's very simple, that while you're here, pursue it. Pursue your passions. Do what you want to do, and do it with all of your heart and all of your energy, all of your enthusiasm. That's the only way to live. Uh, in his mind, that was absolutely the only way to live. To do anything less is to cheat yourself. Because uh, in the end, if you haven't lived your life, if you haven't had your life, what have you had?
you can't go through life avoiding some risks. So as long as the risk, as long as you're aware when it's a little greater risk, you compensate for it by being more careful. The fun is in the doing, not in the accident. At 12 noon on October 4th, 1973, Malcolm Forbes sets off from Coos Bay, Oregon, in the Chateau de Balawan, in an attempt to fly across the United States from coast to coast in the same balloon. Malcolm's attempt at this incredible record came only 15 months after he took his first balloon ride. His son Robert explains. One Monday morning on the way into the city, he and his chauffeur stopped off in Princeton, New Jersey, and took the balloon ride and that he turned into his first lesson towards getting his ballooning license. And he never never looked back since he was determined after that time. I think it was almost immediately he became so thrilled with it that he decided he was going to make a mark in the sport and set out to do something nobody else had done. And that was fly a balloon all the way across the United States. The flight was done in legs. The first 10 days were extremely difficult with the winds moving contrary to the basic pattern of west to east. They made only 788 miles by October 15th. The expedition took off and landed five times before they got out of Oregon. Each night they made camp wherever they landed, sometimes 60 miles from the nearest city. As they flew beyond the Cascades and over the plains of Oregon's flatlands, the nights became increasingly colder. Inflations were always tricky with the mercurial wind patterns. The team was ever cautious of shifting downdrafts. Several hours after they left Springfield, Idaho, the balloon crossed the Rockies into Wyoming, and the chase team radioed this report. 68 degrees at 10 miles. He's right on a ridge stop right now. Uh, he's in pretty, uh, pretty rough stuff here. I don't see any roads. In a million-to-one shot, Malcolm discovers that he is near Jackson Hole, Wyoming, just one mile away from a cabin that he and his wife had built 15 years earlier. As Forbes tries to land the balloon in front of the cabin, a sudden updraft carries him into the forest on the Rockefeller Ranch nearby. When he lands in a small clearing, he finds the balloon is slightly torn. It is dismantled and carried out piece by piece over a mile to the nearest road. The first officially observed leg is after the Balawa balloon left Casper, Wyoming. Moving eastward, their speed increases rapidly, and they attempt to set a new distance record. Balloon to plane. We're heading over Nell's half acre now, and it looks like we're going to keep going for a while. We'll try to break the distance record today. We have a chance to do it. What's our distance right now? When Forbes finally landed in Gurley, Nebraska, he had set a new distance record of 213 statute miles. Turbulence and sudden downdrafts were always a problem for Forbes and his crew. While the prevailing wind pattern was west to east, as they attempted to land, the lower winds are blowing from east to west. No amount of padding could prevent Forbes from taking the beating of his life as the two-man gondola hits the ground at 25 miles per hour, then dumps on its side and drags until the envelope collapses. Along with the chase team, pickup trucks and station wagons arrive from the neighboring towns. Even school was let out for the day as the children gazed with wonder and awe at the phenomenon of this amazing traveling air show. The next day, as they attempt to inflate the balloon, a tear is discovered near one of the side vents. A fully equipped chase team is never complete without a generator and an industrial-sized sewing machine. A piece of fabric is sewn in place. Cars and people seem to spring out of the plains from nowhere, as a large crowd gathers in the middle of this field on a cold October morning. The Chateau de Balawan was once again ready to ascend. In a carnival-like atmosphere, the crowd eagerly watches as Malcolm ignites the burners that will heat the 95,000 cubic feet of air. 
Unexpectedly, something goes wrong. The hot air causes the balloon to rise slightly, but once again, the unexpected occurs. The air is not hot enough for sufficient lift in the swirling current. Malcolm and his co-pilot brace themselves as the gondola comes back down, smashing the rear window of one car, flattening the rooftop of a second car, caving in the side of another, and scraping the hood of yet another. Malcolm, of course, made good on all the damage, and the crowd gets treated to a dramatic exit. This was not to be the last time Forbes would experience difficulty. As they headed east, Malcolm flew much higher than anticipated, at one time reaching 17,400 feet. As the Chateau de Balois flew over Esben, Kansas, clear turbulence sent Forbes and some propane tanks rattling around the gondola. The crosswind gusts was so severe that the burners flamed out at 8,000 feet. The tense moment was relieved when the burners were relit at a lower altitude where the air was calmer. That event was matched later when the balloon became impaled on some power lines near Fredericksburg, Virginia. They were fortunate when the initial contact shorted out the lines, or they could have been easily electrocuted. On the last day of the journey, Forbes steers the craft toward a final landing. It doesn't look good. The direction of the wind isn't as predicted, and Malcolm is headed straight for the Chesapeake Bay. His son, Robert, explains. I went up with him to record the last day's journey, the final touchdown, and uh, we found ourselves in Virginia and caught in a wind pattern that blew us right down the, uh, the valley towards the Chesapeake Bay and finally over the bay, no matter what altitude we went to, and I think we went up 17,000 feet that day, looking for any kind of a crosswind that would take us over some land. We never got any. Final touchdown was in the Chesapeake Bay, a cold November morning. Malcolm set six balloon world records, three for duration and three for distance. But he was most proud of the coveted Harmon Trophy for the greatest contribution to aeronautics in a single year. Though all records are destined to be broken, it will be a long time before someone comes along to duplicate Malcolm Forbes' great transcontinental odyssey. The Atlantic project, as uh, Dad finally called it, uh, I suppose was a spark flared up sometime during his cross-country trip. Uh, nobody ever flown across the Atlantic in a balloon, and uh, certainly nobody had ever gone all the way around the world. There had been attempts made, all had ended uh, either in disaster, failure, or fatality. Uh, so he was quite interested in trying something like this. Some preliminary inquiries, turned up the name Tom Heinzheimer, who was a uh, well-known uh, aerial balloonist, uh, high-altitude balloonist. Uh, and they got together, started talking, found they both had an interest in making this attempt to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. They were going to have 13 of these strung out over a pressurized capsule, a gondola, around a spherical uh, cabin that would uh, support them for however long it took to fly from California to the across the US in the jet stream to test the systems make sure that everything was functioning all right and from there go across the ocean and uh, if everything was going hunky-dory I think they probably would have just kept going and land where they may scheduled for New Year's Day the launch is postponed twice because of weather conditions more apprehensive now because of all the delays Each delay has uh, had its uh, backlash of uh, benefit have you decided on uh, any first words you will say upon your landing? <laughs> no, I think that'll be a happy problem to contemplate after we step out. 3 a.m., Monday morning, January 6, 1975. Banks of floodlights cast an eerie glow across the launch site as Forbes and Tom Heinzheimer are sealed into the gondola. Christened Windborne, the gondola and its entourage of silver balloons are wheeled out of the huge aircraft hangar. Slowly, the lead balloon and first cluster were raised without a problem. As the second cluster went up, a release mechanism slipped and the cluster shot into the air. The launch was put on hold while the crew assessed the situation. Suddenly, disaster strikes. 
A gust of wind tears the balloons from their moorings. The clusters soar upward as the crowd surges forward. To the horror of the launch team, the gondola with its highly flammable liquid oxygen tanks tumbles off the cart and is dragged along the tarmac. At a risk to his own life, Jean-Pierre, the launch director, jumps onto the rolling gondola and cuts the balloons free. It's quick thinking on the part of the launch director to come and release the balloons. They floated away without the capsule, and Dad said he ended up saying that he took the most expensive balloon flight in history, all a matter of, I think it was about two feet, at the cost of over a million dollars. He was heartbroken at that point. They say the difference between the men and boys is the price of their toys. Evolving out of Malcolm's love for motorcycles and balloons came the friendship tours. The combination of exploring a country by motorcycle accompanied by his fantastic balloons was irresistible. February 1984, thousands of Egyptians cheer Forbes as he kicks off the first leg of his tour in El Minya, accompanied by his sons Robert and Timothy. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Fortunately, I, the, uh, I was along on most of the friendship tours, and uh, Egypt was certainly a memorable tour. It was a very exciting time, and there we have the balloon in the shape of the Sphinx. And uh, I tell you, the idea of bringing a Sphinx to Egypt and flying it for the Egyptian people in these various cities was a, a great thrill. They adored it. They had a ball with it. Malcolm will attempt to fly his balloon in Cairo at the sight of the real Sphinx. The Sphinx balloon comes on a personal, individual basis, not as anything official. Everybody will say, that's just that crazy American. 
But I come to you, I hope, not as a crazy American, but as one full of friendship. On this particular day, the crew struggles to keep the basket steady against the late afternoon winds as the local people look on in amazement. The great balloon strains against its earthly chains. Malcolm does not want to disappoint the crowd. I think, I think we're going to have to wait till tomorrow morning when there's less wind, 6 o'clock. Yeah. Malcolm and his crew had to acknowledge that on this day, the shifting winds over the ancient plains had beaten them. By the time Malcolm and his entourage began their motorcycle tour in earnest, they had acquired considerable local status. In some small towns, the simple act of stopping for gas became a major event. Finally, on a clear, cloudless day, in the center of ancient civilization, the town of Luxor became the site for the first free flight of the Great Sphinx. Rising into the sky in the heat of the midday sun, the Sphinx drifted where the wind willed it. It was truly an incredible sight to witness this giant yellow balloon floating gently over Egypt. The decision where to land is made more often than not by the wind. Today, the wind decides to let the yellow Sphinx settle into an open field. Streams of laughing, happy children from all over swarm toward the balloon. Absolutely a delight. Absolutely a delight. The whole city is going to hear sort of a quiet roar of the cheer and enthusiasm. We thought we were in a field of weeds. And I couldn't understand why the, every kid was running up with two or three carrots. I couldn't understand why. It turned out it was a carrot patch. Normally, they're not allowed to raid the fields. And all the kids were walking around like they were uh, eating good humors. But we've made happy peace with the farmer. Uh, he was very nice about it. At first, he was uh, apoplectic. Then uh, when we offered to pay for the damage, he said no. He was proud to have the friendship balloon land on Egyptian soil. The day left Malcolm exhausted. The following morning, the group was making its way to St. Catherine's Monastery through the desert. The asphalt road wound up the coast and came to a sudden stop at the edge of the desert sands. Apparently, they had missed a cutoff. Robert explains. I think we took a wrong turn somewhere and ended up on, uh, well, it wasn't even a, a road per se. It was, a, it was pretty much a trail through the desert. Uh, before we got back on the pavement, and it was going through hours of sand, and it turned out to be a day where they had a, a raging wind, pretty much a sandstorm. Malcolm had hit a large sand pile. All right, okay. Yeah, no problem. Okay. my window. Okay. No problem. I went on my back and locked my window. Okay. I have uh, lost most okay. of my boots. I'll let Robert take over now. Drive carefully, Robert. Drive. Malcolm was in a certain amount of pain. Miles from the nearest doctor, he later discovered he had broken his rib. The hard asphalt was a welcome relief to the dusty crew. That evening, Malcolm arranged for a final act of diplomatic goodwill. It's where he has, we hope. Uh, it's got a good spirit to it. I think it engenders a good spirit. That's the whole point. And you have, we're having fun doing it, and that's quite an important point, too.
Turkey is twice the size of California and has throughout history been the crossroads between Europe and Asia. A few years after Egypt, Malcolm places this country on his itinerary with his most ambitious balloon to date. The entourage pays a visit to Prime Minister Turgat Ozal. Presentation to make you. Should we do it now? <laughs> I hope it fits, sir. I am biggest. <laughs> I get on this side so I don't block the view. Very good. And could we get one picture with the team? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Capital yeah. Steel team. Shortly after dawn the following morning. Forbes heads for a nearby stadium where the team will attempt to inflate the largest creation yet. Forbes had challenged Cameron Balloons to build him a replica of Suleiman, a 16th century warrior who expanded the Ottoman Empire. Suleiman the Magnificent was the most revered of the empire's sultans. Each of Suleiman's eyes is twice the size of a human head. His sword is 65 feet long. When he is fully inflated, Suleiman stands 171 feet high, as tall as a 15-story building. With Suleiman the Magnificent, thanks to his magnificent robes and his traditional dress, no matter where in the future we fly Suleiman in the world, they will almost instantly recognize that this is a man of Turkish history. With Forbes once again leading the pack, the cyclists roar out of Ankara and on to the highway. Everywhere they go, traffic police clear their way amid honking horns and amazed looks. Entering Istanbul, the Forbes caravan crosses the bridge that separates Turkey's largest city and find themselves surrounded by mosques thousands of years old. The daily newspaper and television coverage was tremendous. It couldn't help but abet any future business Forbes might do in this country. The magazine later promoted Turkey in a special advertising supplement. Over the nine days in Turkey, Malcolm and his team had covered 1,300 miles and resurrected the Suleiman six times. Reviving the magnificent balloon one last time, the crew couldn't help but marvel at the way Malcolm had managed to once again captivate a nation as the Suleiman flooded in the breeze bidding a final farewell.
It's how you feel about being alive that makes the difference. I don't believe in spending the whole of this life getting ready for the next one. April 1985. The Forbes Friendship Tour finds itself in Thailand on the first leg of their Southeast Asian journey. The elephant is a powerful and enduring figure in Thailand, deeply rooted in tradition and mythology. Thai mythology reveals how a great white elephant rose from the sea with the magical power to produce rain. Today, the elephant has remained an enduring symbol of fertility. It is still considered good luck to walk beneath the belly of an elephant. We wanted a fitting symbol to visit Thailand with. And the deputy prime minister said it's a lovely elephant, but uh, from the trimmings and the length of the tail, it's obviously an Indian elephant. <laughs> so we changed it from calling it the great Thai elephant to the great sky elephant. So. <laughs> On the evening of the inaugural flight of the great balloon, Malcolm is accorded the ancient Buddhist rite of granting freedom to a captive creature. He fittingly chose an eagle. In Bangkok, on the royal fields of San Nam Long, where all official ceremonies take place, the great sky elephant prepares for its maiden voyage amid the pomp and circumstance that befits a royal occasion. After all, the team was here at the behest of their majesty, the king and queen of Thailand. The elephant had been designed and tested by its builder, but it had never before been inflated by Malcolm's team. Okay, look out for the plane. Look out for the plane. I need one of you to get your hand The crowd looks on with amazement as their great revered symbol slowly takes shape. But today, Malcolm finds he has to fight the constant enemy of any ballooning endeavor, the gusting winds. He struggles to keep the balloon aloft. Finally, with the sun setting and Malcolm at the helm, Her Royal Highness Princess Maha Shakri Sirindhorn becomes the first person to ride the great sky elephant. When a princess makes a request, it's hard to turn her down. The next morning, Malcolm pays for his persistence. What happened to it, Donna? Well, in the high winds at the stadium, I hit with the flame once too often, and we burned two of the very vital supports. So if, uh, we're not going to take a chance until we repaired them. Finally, with repairs completed, the magnificent great sky elephant floats free over Thailand. Malcolm picks the hottest time of the year to take the Harleys through the tropical country. The temperature reaches 110 degrees in the shade and the humidity is over 90%. Timothy Forbes explains. After a few hours in that heat and that sun on a bike, you are totally dehydrated. First 200 miles were the easiest today, and the second 100 miles were. They settled your digestion if you need to. <laughs> yeah, well, the toughest part was going through Bangkok in our rain suits. <laughs> The 
friendship tour continues south across the border into Malaysia to meet the current reigning monarch. They meet at the Royal Johor Bahru Golf Course, where the king has just completed a round. He is so enthralled by the motorcycles that Malcolm gives him the bike he has been riding. <laughs> King's Ride, Millionaire's Walk. When it comes time to set up the elephant, the king offers use of the 18th fairway. This presents one of the most curious sights of the entire tour. The king rides up and down the fairway on a Harley, while a six-story elephant rises above the trees as golfers continue to play on around them. The king, however, chooses not to ride in the balloon. He leaves that to his grandson and the local school children who are here to watch the spectacle. Some would use wealth and power to indulge their personal whims in displays of their excesses, unable to affect themselves, let alone others. Malcolm Forbes was a pragmatic dreamer who acted on his dreams, allowing his greatest visions to be realized. He was a man who loved people. He knew that the value of life was in living itself. His most precious commodity was his passion for being alive, and he knew it could never be sold or traded, only shared. Malcolm demonstrated a never-ending joy for life, a thirst for adventure, a commitment to be true to his epitaph. While alive, he lived.